Back before uh, Kath and I were married, one of my college buddies and I decided to ride our bicycles uh, to Kath's parents' cottage in Wisconsin. It was about a 70-mile trip, and we chose to take the back roads, which, which required riding through a lot of small towns. The ride went uh, smoothly until we reached Woodstock, Illinois. We pretty much got through the town. We're almost out of the city limits when a uh, police car pulled alongside us and pulled us over. And uh, when he got out, we jokingly asked the officer, uh, where were you speeding? Uh, but we recognized right away this guy was in no joking mood. In a firm voice, he asked us who we were, where we were from, and what we were doing. Uh, we politely answered him, uh, but we were puzzled about uh, why he was being so intense. And then it dawned on us. He thought we were smuggling drugs. Uh, you see, we had long hair, and um, my buddy on his bicycle, he had some saddlebags. Uh, and so the guy assumed the worst. But he had a problem to check out our bags, which had our lunch in it. He had to have probable cause to bring us in. So for about 10 minutes, he said and did everything within the proper parameters that he could say to get us to react in a way that he could justify arresting us. But we were not biting on that worm. Everything we said was yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, when he finally realized his tactic was not working, he orders us out of town, which we almost were, and he warned us, you guys ever come back here again, I'm gonna arrest you. Well, as we went on our way, uh, we were relieved, but we were also upset. Who likes to be falsely accused and assumed to be guilty? But it happens. It can happen at home when our spouse or child or parent misinterprets a situation and assumes the worst. It can happen at work when something goes wrong and, and we're blamed for no good reason. It can happen at the grocery store or the hardware store when People see us doing something or saying something to someone else and, and they assume the worst. What are we to do in such situations? And how are we to feel? And what if we're guilty as charged, but, but what we're guilty of doing is really a good thing, not a bad thing? Get some answers to these questions and more. Let's turn to Acts chapter 24 as we continue on our journey with the Apostle Paul. We're reading the first 25 verses. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining, by examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the, at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia 
who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, and that, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It's considering the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, well, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. The Word of God. Well, last week, you know, we covered the, uh, the passage where you know, Paul was uh, uh, taken on a hasty journey uh, to Caesarea in the middle of the night. And he was taken there to, to Governor Felix so he could then answer to the charges made against him by Ananias and the Sanhedrin in a more safe place. We pick up the story five days later when the hearing took place. However, before we dig into this trial, we need to know something about the judge. Governor Felix's background was a lot like the background of the politicians of our day. He grew up in the court of the emperor. Uh, he was born a slave, but at a, a young age was freed by the uh, emperor's mother. Growing up with the future emperor and having a brother who was among also among the royal court, I mean, he went all, to all the right schools, made all the right connections in order to begin a political career. And his, the beginning was as a, in a subordinate post uh, in, in Samaria. And Samaria, obviously, is Israel, what we would know as Israel. Uh, while there, he uh, managed to man manipulate himself into the position of governor by getting his predecessor uh, called back to Rome. And this guy also kind of acted like a Hollywood star, as he had already married three times in order to secure uh, more power and popularity. His first wife was no one less than the daughter of Antony and Cleopatra. So he dumped her to move up and on. His third and present wife was Drusilla, a Jewess, who he had helped would help him connect with the people of Israel who was, who was in charge of ruling. Now, it didn't hurt that she was also considered drop-dead gorgeous. He courted Drusilla while she was still married, uh, he just convinced her, hey, Drusilla, you got to drop this guy and come with me because you'll move up in society and live a more comfortable life. Um, he was known as a heavy-handed ruler and was described by the historian Tacitus as a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. Uh, it should not surprise us that he kind of struggled to rule over uh, Israel uh, as they continued to rebel against his iron-fisted rule. I mean, his strategy in dealing with the rebellions was when in doubt sent in the assassins. To say he was disliked in Israel would be a major, major understatement. Yet, this was the guy who would decide whether Paul was innocent or guilty. Now we're ready for the trial. Ananias is there with representatives from the Sanhedrin, but we are told that he brought in a lawyer by the name of Tertullus. Probably he wanted a professional in order to make uh, his case uh, solid. Figuring this guy would know what it would take to convince Felix to convict Paul. Before presenting any charges, Tertullus took the time to extra extravagantly praise Felix for his outstanding leadership over the years over Israel. And he told Felix how much Ananias... And the Sanhedrin appreciated him being their ruler. How this lawyer said all this with a straight face, and how Felix kept from breaking out in laughter, I don't know. Because everyone in the room understood this was a bunch of baloney. But Tertullus must have felt that uh, buttering up a judge uh, was never a bad thing to do when you're going to trial. When he finally gets down to business, Tertullus' strategy was apparent he realized a pagan a governor would have little interest in religious differences between Paul and the Sanhedrin. Thus, he focuses, focuses efforts on painting a picture of Paul as troublemaker and rebel. He wanted Felix to know if Paul was let go, he'd be a threat to the peace of Rome, which was his job to uphold. 
And this is why we hear him charging Paul with stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world and asserting that Paul was this ringleader of a sect. And that the reason that Jews had seized him was just because Paul was desecrating the temple. They had to stop him. After uh, his presentation, Ananias and his representatives offered their confirmation as to the truthfulness of these charges that were presented and this description of Paul. Capellus kept things short and sweet, knowing that the governor appreciated brevity and he hoped for a quick judgment because he knew what would happen if the governor actually attempted to verify the truthfulness of the charges they were making. Well, then it was Paul's turn. Paul did not try to butter up the judge, but he did acknowledge. He was thankful for Felix being his judge because he knew Felix had been around a while, long enough to understand that of the hatred the Sanhedrin held toward Christianity. Paul's first agenda item was to refute the charges that he was leading some kind of revolution or was some notorious troublemaker. And he does this just by disclosing the facts and inviting Felix to check them out. He also makes the observation about his accusers that they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. Really, at this point, Paul could have concluded his defense and not addressed the religious aspect of it at all, since apparently it was of little interest to the case. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he addresses the white elephant in the room, and talk specifically about the real reason that the Sanhedrin were there. I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I think one reason why Paul does this is because he, what we're told in verse 22 about Felix, and Felix, who was well acquainted with the way. Really, what we learn there is that this verse confirms that Felix and probably everyone in the room they understood the real reason for this case against Paul was not because Paul was a rebel against Rome, rather it was because Paul was a believer in Jesus. Paul assured Felix he was not trying to, to demolish the Christian religion, rather he was, he was pointing out that Christianity was the fulfillment of everything that was taught in the Old Testament. And he picks on the vital issue, the clear concern that both parties had, that they shared which was life after death. And how one is to look forward to such life rather than fearing it. Paul's final words to the court, it's concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm trial before you today. What's the verdict? Felix never gave one. Rather, he offered the excuse of having to hear from Lysias, the commander, before making such a judgment, even though he already had Lysias' report in hand. Now, with all the evidence before him, why does he do this? I believe Felix knew the charges were bogus, but at this time, he was under a lot of pressure from Rome to keep things calm, to keep the peace. And he knew if he called Paul innocent, there would be some rebellions going on in Jerusalem. So he didn't want that, so he keeps Paul in custody, which would placate the Sanhedrin, but also... By not declaring Paul guilty, he kept Paul out of their hands and alive. Doesn't sound like much of a win for Paul in his first attempt as a defense attorney, but that was okay because, listen to what came about because of Paul's defense before Felix. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. How do we explain that Felix's invite to Paul? He certainly didn't live like someone who was concerned about life after death. But maybe it was Paul's calm defense against false charges and his hammering upon the real issue of eternal life and a future judgment that kind of intrigued Felix. This was not Felix's first encounter with Christians, but it was his first chance to have a private conversation with someone like Paul. But what it meant to follow Christ. Uh, maybe deep down, Felix was feeling guilty, guilty about his greed and lust and selfishness. Maybe he brought his wife there for the same reason. Perhaps this constant pressure from Rome to do better or else made him think about the possibility that sooner rather than later, he might 
face a trial. Whatever the reason, he listened to Paul as he spoke about faith in Jesus and about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, I don't know what Felix and Drusilla were expecting to hear, but this must not have been it. I think they were looking to buy some spiritual fire insurance. They had no desire to change their lives. We don't have to do that. They were looking for some kind of easy payment plan for heaven. Paul says there's, there's no such plan. You have salvation, you have to repent. Realize you're a sinner and give your life to Christ. And tragically, that price sounded too high for both Felix and his wife as they declined. Well, they really didn't decline. They said, uh, well, we want to wait for a more convenient time. In less than two years, they would be called back to Rome and to face no one less than Nero. And then we are not told what became of their end. Uh, it probably was not a good one. But what are we to learn and apply from the story? How do we respond? When we are wrongly accused. And many times it's easy to fire back in anger. Maybe fire back with false accusations of our own. Or sometimes we're scared, we run and hide, or, or we're just simply stunned into silence. How about the next time we're wrongly accused? We learn from Paul. We listen to what the person is saying. And then as calmly as we can, we point them to the truth of the matter. Maybe we cannot change feelings, but we can present facts. Then we pray that those who hear will respond to the facts that are presented. The strategy, uh, though, is only effective if the accusations against us are false. And that we have been trying to do what is good and right. I mean, if we're guilty of doing wrong, then our focus must be on admitting our errors and sins, seeking forgiveness from them and from God, and then repenting and doing what's right. But what about if the charges are true? But we're saying these charges are true, but they shouldn't bring us punishment. They should bring us praise. We're doing something good. We'd say participate in a pro-life walk or, or voice a concern for the unborn threatened by abortion. That may get us charged with a hate crime. This is Paul was hated for his love of Jesus. But just like Paul, we're not to be afraid or not to apologize for doing right. Rather, we need to show them the rightness of our actions. Let's be the one to mention the elephant in the room. Be willing to talk about our faith and not do it in anger or as out of a judgmental spirit, but out of desire for the other person to see the wisdom and goodness of our actions and beliefs. What are we here to learn and apply? If you've not noticed, uh, there's not many in Washington, D.C. who care much about Jesus. They don't care much about anything except how to get elected for life and uh, what will give them more power or wealth. How are we to deal with such a situation with our rulers? Well, let's not play the role of Ananias and Tertullus and praise our leaders, hoping that they will reward us or they'll pick on someone else. But let's also not stick our head in the sand and pretend things aren't as bad as they really are. How about when under the gun from our leaders, we, we thank God that we can still make a defense for our cause or our case. We can still talk to them about the falseness of the charges made against us, our God, our church, and present evidence that, that proves such charges wrong. You don't have to be a genius to do this. That's just like with Felix. You know, we know our real, rulers have at least some working knowledge of what Christianity is about. And there's always that possibility that God is working in their hearts like he was working in Felix's. So what can happen when we respond to false charges? Like Paul did, it may earn us an opportunity for a private conversation with an unbeliever who is hearing us, and, and they, they have some questions that they want to ask us and in private because they don't want anyone else around uh, to maybe embarrass them or put them on the spot. Ever had such a conversation with someone? Well, for that to happen, people, first of all, have to see a love for them in us. Also, they have to know enough about what we believe to be curious about it. How can they be curious about something they've never heard from us? 
And when we answer their questions, um, we cannot be afraid of scaring them away with the truth. A long time ago in a Bible study, uh, uh, a woman told me she would never tell people about the cost of following Jesus because she thought that would scare, scare them away. Um, but the reality is that no one has good reason to come to Jesus to be saved unless they're first told the bad news that they're a sinner and need salvation. And, you know, uh, Jesus did want people to what? To account the cost before choosing to follow him. He didn't want anyone to be surprised that to be saved meant you had to give your life to Christ your whole life and allow Jesus to live through you. Remember, our job is not to sell the gospel. That is not our job, but we're not to be gospel sellers. We are to be gospel presenters. We are just to present the gospel and allow God to work. So how's that going for us? When was the last time someone said, hey, pull us aside. Can you tell me more about what it means to be a Christian? And maybe if that hasn't happened, we need to ask God to convict us to work in our life so it's more apparent through our actions and our words that we're following Jesus. Um, how do we do that? And what do we do when, when uh, you know, people question us and want to know what it takes to be saved? Yeah, we need to be honest and, and we need to be open and, and we, we're not supposed to hold back on some fact that we might fear might scare them. It's not our job to judge the lost. It's our job to inform the lost about the facts of faith and salvation. That's our job. What are we to learn and apply? Whenever I hear someone respond to the facts of the gospel by saying, not yet. I've heard that a few times in my life. It saddens me. Because most of the time I know that not yet means no. And the reason for this often goes back to the fact that, actually, why would anyone say not yet to a personal relationship with Jesus. Why would you do that? Why would you say not yet to eternal life? Why would you say not yet to life to the full? Why would you say not yet to having the Holy Spirit in your life? Why say not yet to that? Why would you say not yet unless you're thinking there's a whole bunch of other things that are more important and more life-fulfilling than becoming a Christian? Think about it. How many people would say, not yet today, to, hey, let me give you a million dollars. Oh, no, not yet. Let me give you a better job. Oh, no, not yet. Or, hey, let me offer you this free dream vacation. Oh, no, no, not yet. They would take up us up on that offer in a heartbeat. Because those offers kind of coincide with what they think life to the full is about, what, what they want their life to be. Okay, what they're saying then is, if I say yes to Jesus, it's not a good thing. It's going to drain me of life, not give me life. Now they'll say this, okay, if, if I have a choice between dying and going to hell or dying and going to heaven, I'll, I'll pick Jesus. If it gets down to that, I'll do it. I prefer Jesus to hell. That's about the only reason I'm ever going to say yes to Jesus. See, those people are like, no matter how bad my life is going, I believe it's only, it's only going to get worse if I give my life to Jesus. Again, if this is a person's attitude, they're always going to say, not yet. You know, the day they die, they die in their sleep, or, or by that time, the, the heart's growing so hard, nothing would ever make them say yes to Jesus. That's so sad. So what are we to say? What are we to pray when we're dealing with someone who's saying, not yet to Jesus. I think the first thing we need to assure them of is, you know what? God is the greatest giver of all. If he asks you to give up something, he will, he will give you back so much more. He's the greatest giver. Again, he promises, promises us life to the full, life for forever. How do you come out a loser in that? 
Why would you say no to that? Yes. You guys say? Only those willing to lose their life can gain it. Only those willing to give it away can receive it. And that's the truth. That is the truth. You want life? You have to give it to Him. Let's also remember what Jesus told us about in Matthew 6. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Our life here is like a mess. It's, it's, it's over so quickly. Here today, go on tomorrow. That means all that stuff that we're so worried about getting and, and keeping, one day it's going to disappear. It won't be ours anymore. All the stuff that we were clinging to so we, so we couldn't say yes to Jesus. But again, if we follow Jesus, he gives us fullness of life and life forever. And if we invest our life in what Jesus calls us to invest our life in, we can take it all with us to heaven. There's never a good reason to say not yet to Jesus. So let's be honest. So let's say not yet, just say, okay, I'm saying no. I still believe that it isn't that bad yet for me to accept Jesus. But I know if I accept him now, it's going to ruin my life. It's going to make my life worse. If that's where you are. I pray for you. I hope we've said yes. But if we haven't yet said yes, we're told in Scripture that today, not tomorrow, not the next day, not a convenient time. Today is the day of salvation. Why? We can say yes to Jesus today. Let's make the right choice. There's a lot to learn and apply from this passage, so let us ask God to work into our hearts the lessons that God is teaching us here. Let's pray. Father, um, we thank you for the example of Paul, who was unfairly, wrongly accused and charged. And yet, when given the opportunity to defend himself, he did it calmly. Um, he showed the rightness of his actions. And he showed the falseness of the charges. And he mentioned the elephant in the room. What was really all about following you? But Father, we also learn a lot from Felix. A guy who was intrigued, curious about the faith. But once he got the particulars, the cost of following Jesus, he said, nah, not yet. He wanted to wait for a more convenient time. It didn't end well for him. Father, we pray for those in our family, in our workplace, in our school, who are doing the same thing. And somehow see having Christ in their life as something that will take away their joy, take away their life, take away their hope when it's the opposite. So Father, help us through our, our life to show them that life with Jesus is a fulfilled life, a purposeful life, a joyful life. And they see that in us and be curious and want to ask us about our faith. Father, forgive us for the fact that people aren't doing that more often, that they're not seeing that in us. Father, help us to focus on that. But Father, also, when they ask, help us to be honest and open and not be afraid to, to share the truths. Uh, that, that even if they, those truths might be kind of scary to hear. But Father, those truths are the truths about life, about Jesus, the most important truths of all. So Father, again, I do pray for anyone in this room who has said not yet and is still saying not yet. Uh, may they realize today there's no good reason to say no to Jesus. So why say no to eternal life? Why say no, say no to life to, to the full? Uh, why say no to the Holy Spirit being in our heart? Father, there's, there's every great reason to say yes. So Father, I pray that today they will say yes. Today is the day of salvation. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.